Hello everyone, welcome to the Jcast Network. I'm your host, Arvind Herman. Many of you remember the Havana Gula from your bar or bat mitzvah or even wedding. We had the opportunity to speak to the director of Hava Nagila movie, Roberta Grossman, about where Hava came from and where it's going. Let's take a closer look. Hava Nagila, Hav to Nagila, Hav Nagila, they're pretty small. What is happening to you? Is it a uh, dance? Like the polka? It's some sort of celebration song. La 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 la. They sang and danced at my bar mitzvah, but other than that, I have some clues. It could be some kind of food. Nagila. That much I know. Relentless. It's resilient. But then again, so are cockroaches. That song is immediately a connection back to tradition and community. One that just takes me back to a sense of, well, that's who I should be. Or that's who I'm supposed to be. It is a melody that evokes new life and hope and joy. And that's a wonderful symbol for the Jewish people to have and for the rest of the world to think of as being a Jewish symbol. <laughs> When I went anywhere in the world, there were two songs that stood out. One was Deo and Avanagila. It was a song that was, would run through my head. People would say, Are you have any Jewish blood in you? I said, yes, I am 10% Jewish on my manager's side. Whenever it would start, everyone would just get happy. Touching moments uh, that that I that I loved in the movie was when you actually saw Hava Nagila uh, being sung uh, in different parts of the world and how it uh, it really transcended uh, a Jewish uh, type of song and uh, people would just embrace it from uh, from Mexico to Harvard uh, Benavente just you know belting out the Havana Gila, it just, it was so, it was just amazing to, to see. Um, how do you go about, I guess, putting it all together so that you could tell the story of uh, Havana Gila? Well, I mean, what we really set out to do is to tell the biography of a song. Havana Gila is the hero of the story, and basically it's a classic story structure. We were following the hero's journey from origins in the Ukraine as a Hasidic Nigun, emigrating to Palestine, coming to the United States, you know, making it big in the United States, crossing over, and then asking the question, uh, like in The Jazz Singer, okay, now that Hava made it in America, did it lose its soul? So that's the basic structure, and you know, using Hava as a stand-in, really, for 200 years of the Jewish journey. Was there anything that surprised you during the course of, uh, of putting the movie together? Did, did you, sometimes when you, um, you know, putting together a movie, you have like a certain vision. Uh, but did anything surprise you during the course of, uh, of putting the movie together? Yeah, I think the biggest surprise was that it ended up in part being a film about the Holocaust after all. Um, that it really, I, I saw the 50s and the 60s uh, in a new way uh, through the lens of Havana Gila and, and realized that, you know, where maybe me and 
you know, many, many other people saw American Jewish life in the 60s, 50s and 60s as perhaps being somewhat shallow or watered down. But, you know, American Jews are really dealing with some very heavy stuff. On one hand, dealing with the, you know, the rebirth of the state of Israel, what that meant for American Jews who didn't want to go there. And, you know, more importantly, or not more importantly, but also dealing with, um, you know, the Holocaust and coming to grips with what had happened. And I think Havana Gila was a response to both those very big historical events. There was a, there was a scene when uh, you were um, explaining the, the, the intricacies of the Havana Gila, then connecting with the Hora, and then towards the end is like saying like how Hava, like it, it came back, but it was like people were like were fighting against the Hava, like the Hava, which is I don't know, it just it, it, for me it's a little bit weird. I don't know why why people would, would fight against it. Uh, what do you think? Well, I don't think people actually fought against it. it just you know, for, that was one of the things I wanted to find out. You know, when, once I started looking into Hava and realized that Klezmer musicians really hate Hava. I wanted to find out why. It didn't really make sense. It's, it had its origins as a Hasidic nigun in Eastern Europe, which is, you know, where klezmer music comes from, um, you know, from many different sources in Eastern Europe. Um, and so I, I really didn't get it, you know. I thought it was just sort of a, um, a, you know, uh, a silly attitude or, or a prejudice or whatever. Then I came to understand really what it meant. And that Hava came to represent everything that people from the klezmer revival uh, d didn't like um, the watering down of, of Jewish culture, the in part the, the way that Israeli and Hebrew culture washed out or swept aside Ashkenazi and other Jewish you know cultures that had been very vibrant in the United States before that, and then also as musicians who were trying to revive you know klezmer music and the whole rich tradition of of Eastern Europe, the fact that every time a klezmer band would go to a wedding or bar mitzvah and want to play all these fabulous songs they were resurrecting. Uh, they were just saying, well, just play Hava Nagila, and that, and that people would be satisfied, and that's all they wanted in terms of Jewish uh, uh, culture, in quotes, um, from those musicians. So it became a joke among Klezmer musicians, and, and Hava became a symbol of uh, some very frustrating realities. And you know, when you look at the, um, the scope uh, of Jewish music, and even uh, in the movies, you always, when there's that Jewish scene, you know, the, the Hava Nagila, Right. Is wrong. Why do you think, uh, to this day, um, it is such an important part of our Jewish culture? I think it's very joyful, um, and I think it's a time when people come together, literally, literally and figuratively. Uh, and I think also that there's some power in Hava that maybe is beneath the surface. That maybe because Hava has rolled its way through Jewish history, from you know the the flowering of the Hasidic movement in Eastern Europe, the create conscious creation of a Hebrew culture in Palestine you know, before statehood, it was, you know, heyday of American Jewish arrival in the United States, that Hava has a lot of layers to it. And I also think that maybe because it began life as a Nigun, maybe it has some spiritual uh, layer to it as well. And, and also it's a great tune. Uh, and then once you've done it once or twice, you're not only doing Hava, you're, when you're doing the Hava, you're doing the Horror to Hava an event, you're remembering the previous occasions. So it's something that, uh, that builds on itself. You you show the this you know how Hava kind of evolved over over time. Um, where do you think Hava Nagila will go in the next the next I, century? I really don't know. I actually, when you were asking the question, I was imagining a little horror on the moon or on Mars or something like that. But I um, I think I think Hava will not disappear. I think that. You know, just like we still do certain Jewish families, Jewish religions still, there's traditions that are 2,000 years old. I think that Haba is going to work its way in, if it hasn't already, as being part of the tradition and not simply a song. What was um, your favorite Haba Nagila? Hmm. That's asking me to pick between my children. <laughs> Oh, I guess if I'd have to pick, I'd say Connie Francis's Hava Nagila. I just, I just love the way she did it. The, um, the idea of um, Jewishness and how it, it, it blends with, with society is, is kind of um, interesting in terms of the way that music sort of definitely transcends the way that, um, that people connect to each other. Um, how do you think Jewish music uh, is able to to do that? I don't understand the question. Uh, Jew Jewish music is is sort of it, it 
it incorporates so many different Jewish values, but basically how the, the non-Jewish world is able to take that and make it their own uh, and able to then connect their their constituents or their, or, their, or their people to it. I mean, I guess if you're talking about Haba, I can answer the question. If you're talking about Jewish music, which is so diverse, I'm, you know, by far an expert on that. But if you're talking about Haba and why Haba, why Haba crosses over, I think Haba crosses over because it's a joyful song. And it's a great tune. It's a you know it's a hit on the global jukebox. And you've been to a number of festivals, um, and how has the audience uh, received it? It's been really quite overwhelming. My experience so far is that uh, people walk into a theater, a group of you know of diverse individuals, and within five minutes of watching the film, they're at least at the Jewish film festivals, a Jewish community having a Jewish communal experience. And people are laughing, and people are touched. People are remembering their own lives through the lens of the film, and it's been it's been really uh, a very warm embrace. And where can people uh, see the film now? Um, the film opens tomorrow, March first, Friday, March first, at the Lincoln Plaza Cinemas. Uh, Mar opens March eighth in Florida, ten different theaters. Uh, opens in Southern California, March fifteenth, and then it will roll out from there. If people want to find out where to see the film, they can go to the website, havanagilamovie.com, and check it out. Right, well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And I uh, it really was a fantastic film. Oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Bye. As you can see, Havanagila is part of our Jewish DNA. It'll be for many years to come. This is Aaron Herman. Thank you for watching.